my name is Heidi Hassel, and I'm the president of Harvard Seminary, and I'm very happy to welcome each, um, each and every person here. Uh, welcome to Harvard Seminary. I know it's going to be um, uh, uh, entertaining, but also a thoughtful um, evening together this year. Um, so, a warm welcome, and um, I know you've been looking forward to this as much as I have. Tonight's lecture is named for Michael Ryan, a former president of Harvard Seminary. Michael is Uh, that provides primary health care for the uninsured of 
recovered from what we are now are 30,000 patient visits in a little more than seven years. And there are two people here tonight who are very much a part of that. That's Bob Bartuka, who is at Memorial City, who is the executive director. And Bob Dunbar did a really hard stuff of getting people in when we started this dream. And I'm pleased to say that the dream is now in Waterbury. We're about to open in New Haven. Uh, that opens next week in Baltimore. We're talking about sites in southern Illinois and Columbus, Ohio, five sites in New Jersey. And within five years, we will probably be in something like 25 to 30 sites in America. And each one of these organizations, a full operation, will take care of about 4,500 patient visits a year, which starts to put a dent into a very empty hole. It's a really last, uh, that is the ultimate. Uh, saving net. So, anyway, thank you for being here. All uh, when my new friends at Harvard said I was elected to the board today, I said, Why would you want me to give the Ryan or the old lecture? If anybody in Belgium or, or here? Uh, at the uh, Harvard Center. Uh, I'm, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a moralist. Uh, I'm not an academician. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm retired. I'm a, a, a recovery lawyer, as you said. Uh, I'm a politician. I'm a lobbyist. What in heaven's name? These did not simply appear to be a set of credentials that would make me eligible for this particular lecture. John Lee gave me the answer. He said, my actual life has been full of uh, experiences that deal with the hopes and dreams of people and how to enable them to live better lives. And that this indeed is a form of ministry uh, arising out of the values I hold deeply. So that in that spirit, and I have to tell you totally out of character, I'm going to say some basic things about it basic values. Uh, I'm a practicing Roman Catholic, a modern one to boot. Uh, I was born in the South End of Harvard. Uh, I am uh, the fourth of five children in a uh, Irish family that has been in business in this community since 1886. My father, John P. Kelly, or to those who really know him, called Black Jack. I don't think that he used he had Black Jack. I think it was because he used a tool called Black Jack. I had been very successful in business and in politics, and was considered to be a very powerful man here. In the early 40s were the days when the word welfare did not attach to the poor. That didn't exist. Uh, the only safety net available to people in need in those days was actually the urban political system. And it might be a job, it might mean assistance. It might mean something, but it would mean something to people in need. So as a very young man, I spent a great deal of time with my dad traveling around the city. I spent many, many hours in the humble uh, living surroundings of a lot of people. Uh, blacks, Italians, Jews, Irish, and others. All first and second generation Americans. And all, and watched my father deal with them day by day uh, with, with these ordinary people who needed help. It was an idol for me. His day always started at 7 a.m. Mass at St. Augustine Church in the south end of Hartford, usually followed by 45 minutes or so cutting coffee with the working men who labored in the MDC sewage treatment plant down near Hartford Field. Life, a word in quotes, all came together for me soon after my father died. On the second night of his way, after meeting senators, governors, members of Congress, a cabinet secretary, mayors, commissioners, a lot of wealthy people on the light, all of a sudden, a stream of a hundred men or more dressed in their everyday working uniforms in the sewage treatment plant uniforms clean and pressed appeared, actually crying over the loss of my father. Tears fell from my eyes. 
the symbol of life really was all about. That we must keep our focus on ways to make life better for everyone, but especially for those who haven't been given the advantage of birth, power, wealth, and other things. And so the spirit of the Catholic Church has also had a major impact on the values gained by immersion in the teachings of my church, as in your own, led me to focus in that very direction. And very, very happily, certainly for us, and I think for the world, most recently we've been elevated by the words of Pope Francis. He has raised the world's attention to these important uh, objectives of life and renewed focus of Catholics and non Catholics alike on making a difference to those in need. These days I happen to work a great deal with the Islamic community in the Middle East. And you do not understand how significant it was that the Pope would wash the feet of a Muslim woman, take the abuse from the right wing of the church, but took that step as a measure of his respect for the world in which we live. The other day I saw, uh, and this is obviously, I'm new here because I couldn't see it's on everything. I saw a printed line exploring differences deepening things. An interesting that's what I'm talking about. Back in 1979, uh, I joined with two other leaders of our national parties, Republican National Chairman Bill Rock and our colleague, who was finance chairman, Chuck and uh, myself, at the F Street Club in Washington, to discuss the establishment of a structure that would deal with the increasing number of uh, people from lands other than ours asking, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you run an election? What's the process? Um, that simple beginning has turned into a string of democratization combinations that work across this sphere of this world in the new arena called democratization, with thousands of professionals, literally thousands, 48,000 people count, who've been through the process, uh, young and old, assisting people of countries across the world. Uh, I think our initial budget was $500,000, and uh, last year, the combination of about 20 of these organizations that have grown from the start was about $1.6 billion. In this endeavor, I've worked in Sub Saharan Africa, Central America, the Southern Cone of South America, all of Eastern and Central Europe, and over the past decade through the International Foundation for Electoral Systems uh, in the Islamic world, literally the 10th parallel from Indonesia to Libya, I've got to make it to Algeria, so Libya is far from Europe. And as we work with the transition of a nation and its peoples from despotic rule to democracy, we necessarily explore differences and seek to adopt democratic principles to the culture of the specific people we are working with. People often say to me, uh, do you just teach them what we do? And I say, well, let me understand something. You need to understand something. Democracy in Detroit and democracy in Ann Arbor are very different things. <laughs> Don't be surprised. And that, that's what we have to deal with. We also concentrate on deepening faith in uh, these nations and in these people. In this case, faith in themselves. A sense of confidence that they can do what has to be done. So why the focus on democracy? You know, there's a common line, Greg, you and I live in that world, but democracy is the worst form of government until you try another one. <laughs> uh, the electoral process is the first step in a country that this must, uh, the transition must make. For us, elections are not the ultimate objective, but only the means to provide a setting in which people can explore the transition to our responsible use of freedom, economic opportunity, and personal development. The electric, electrical uh, the electrical process can involve some stunning, stunning change. Consider Iraq. In 2002, we were called to come to Iraq. We were actually working with uh, the UN, uh, not USAID, uh, to put together an electoral process. As we started, one of the objectives was to empower women. Empower women not only to vote, but also to all office. How could we ever do that in Iraq? Women were below their chickens 
bringing you below the livestock that they earn a living on. What can we do? Well, imagination went to work. If you were in Iraq in those days, still today, if you want to eat, you have to register to be part of the Food for Oil program. And so over a period of six months, we arranged to have the registration for oil and the registration for vote happen to be the same thing. And we require the head of every household, male by definition, to bring everyone from their household in to register over the age of 18, boys and girls. And guess what? We ended up with a large number of women registered to vote. Under the concept of the new government structure of the original parliament, which would be 500 seats, 250 of them elected on a national basis under, I think, the political science call uh, proportional representation. So, 250 seats by a major party, I've got 250 candidates. And if I got 10% of the, the top 25, the first 10% in that order would be elected to the problem. Well, we arranged to have the Constitution require that every third nominee on every one slate had to be a woman. The net result was pretty awesome. 28% of the first problem in Iraq was women. Women voted, women governed. Iraq had experienced one change, albeit very reluctantly, and that change would have a marked impact on its current life and more importantly on its to come. Subsequent to the electoral process, there are many more serious things we have to do. This is just the beginning. We have to deal with establishment of a rule of law, as opposed to the rule of men uh, or women, <laughs> institutional development, uh, the, the, the very structure that we live in every day, education, communications, entertainment, political parties, volunteer organizations, and business structures, unknown to a lot of these parts of the world. Religious freedom, of course, and ultimately, uh, economic opportunity. Imagine when people are allowed to live freely, a lot of good things happen. One day I was in Moscow, I used to spend a lot of time driving in a 25 year old Zill. That's a classic, ancient uh, uh, limousine. You know, this one was found in Afghanistan and bought there by my driver. And we're driving along in the front seat, and there's a, a book next to me in Cyrillic. I pick it up and I say to the driver, who's a 50 year old guy, who's a Jewish, and I said, What's the book? And he says, Oh, it is the Old Testament. I said, Wonderful, I have you had it long? And he said, No, I can now read it without fear. I have returned to where I belong. That really made a moment set all about what can take place. A few stories. Uh, relationships are everything. We are going to hear that again and again. As for the life relations are indeed everything. They typically encompass trust and confidence in one another derived from specific mutual experience. Here's an example of democracy. Uh, the Center for Democracy, which I chaired at the time, the Bipartisan Foundation, had been intensely working in Central America since 1986. If you can think back that far, it was a disaster, it was a nightmare of conflicts everywhere in Central America. It was October 1989, and a critical time in the history of Central America. That presidential elections on a while, and one opening up in December, January, and February, um, and then all five of our democratic countries. It was a political disaster, and the factions within the country would not deal with each other. They didn't talk. They didn't talk with each other. Not the right center. They didn't talk. There was no communication across state boundaries, uh, country boundaries. Uh, simply animosity was everywhere. So the Center for Democracy sponsored a conference in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, where we invited some 40 European parliamentarians to come to meet with their counterparts uh, from the five countries of Central America, the five democracies of Central America. Central Americans, as you may not know, are Eurocentric. That's where they come from, and that's the way they focus. You know? The United States is something else. Or Euro Center. They were really excited about all of these parliamentarians coming from Western Europe. Our primary purpose, however, was really quite different. Uh, we were going to do that conference, but our real purpose was 
to draw in the candidates for president, all of them into San Jose. And what we did was we suddenly asked them, hey, we have a room set aside. We'd like you all to come together and spend some time talking. And we had all, every presidential candidate in every country but uh, El Salvador, where the, where the election was like four weeks later, we had their chief of staff. Uh, 90 minutes after this meeting started, uh, the man who ultimately would become the president of Costa Rica in two months. By the way, uh, Kennedy Robert Brooks spent a lot of time down there doing the El Salvador, where so they did a big save. Uh, Salvador is a very critical very true, very proud. He wears the cross on the Knights of Malta, who's one of the Knights of San John, excuse me, bring up all these religious differences. Anyway, uh, they, uh, they come out after 90 minutes, the, the man who was elected to be, ultimately elected to be President Costa Rica, Costa Rica. And he said, would you mind if we spent some more time together? We said, no, that's fine. We'll hold off the conference. This is what we're here for. They spent another 90 minutes. So after this three hours of communication, we put the five of us went back in the room. And they said, this is the most important political meeting any of us have ever had. We actually talked to one another. We actually talked about how we can communicate with each other. We actually talked about how we would work with factions with our own country. And they said, we'd like you to do two things. They said, uh, first, could you organize a meeting like this in, in April of 1990? Uh, we'd like to do this again. And they said, well, we could probably do that. And second, could you uh, help us in putting together a conclave of the presidents of Central America that would meet regularly so that we are in full communication. Uh, we said yes, we can do that. That organization exists today. It still functions and functions well. It's one of those examples where something actually works. Some months later, I was in Guatemala City and I was meeting with a fellow named Jorge, Jorge Carpio. Jorge was a very uh, anti American right wing tough guy. And we started working with him in 1986. By 1989, he was very different. Anyway, in this meeting, he reached across the table and grasped my arm. And he said, Peter, you have changed the world we live in. Last week, I spent a weekend with the president of Costa Rica at his home. I now communicate with my colleagues here in our Miami's and now my friends. And we now live differently. Life is so much better. A humorous story. Um, strong relationships can also give strong, wrong impressions. Now, in those days, uh, Republicans and Democratic kind of people were friends. We're all friends. We're very compassionate friends, close friends. Actually, we're better friends because, as Greg knows, in a, in a political world, the one you have to fear is the one in your own party. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. It's going to kill you. We have pride on the other side. We know we have to have a conflict in November. That's okay. So, Anyway, so we were very close to each other in those days and did a little shtick that uh, can be fun. So this particular thing, it was late 1986, it was an extremely busy time in my day. You will remember we took the Senate back that year, right? Yeah, I was a nasty person. I ran that. So I knew you appreciated that. We, I, I, this, I, there was a guy who wanted to run for president of, of Lebanon. And he had all, all of the requirements. He was extremely wealthy. He was a banker. And he had a militia of all 10,000 people. So he's perfect. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. But the only time I could see it was 6 o'clock at the Grand Hyatt in Georgetown. Because I had a 5.30 meeting with somebody else. And I'm there with this meeting with this other person. And I see the Lebanese guy come in and sit three or four people away. And then Dick Allen walks in. Now, Dick Allen, for those who don't know, was the National Security Advisor to a guy named Martin Reagan. He was a very visible Republican leader. And Dick saw me and he came across. I stood 
the gun deflected, <laughs> just my ring. I stood, and he went to his table. <laughs> so, ten minutes later, the Lebanese presidential candidate sitting with me and he said, Peter, uh, you were never going to have a He said, the Richard Allen, these security, initial security buses. I said, yes. Is he Republican, right? I said, yes. In, in real life, I'm a singer. Actually, I sang before. I, I had the great pleasure of meeting the new pastor of the Salomon Congregational Church. This good Catholic boy sat on the Salomon Congregational Church of Artorio for 21 years. I spent more time in that church, I think, than any other as a woman in church. <laughs> anyway, my wife Susan was here as a former opera singer. Music is really important to us. So, as we venture into the international art, we learn something. And that is, music was a powerful tool that breaks down barriers that don't seem to be able to move. An example, in 1992, the Center for Democracy, again, sponsored a meeting of 128, as it turned out, small meeting democratic leaders from Eastern and Central Europe. We had everybody, that's like Central Europe, we had Eastern Europe. Everybody, what three countries, Albania, Eastern Germany, we never played with anybody. And uh, and uh, the Hawaii we missed this somehow, I don't know. But they were all there. And the first day we were meeting in the the room of the Solidarity Center, which was a very slow moving tortoise of democracy, but very slow moving, but we were there. And we started at two in the afternoon and all these people were seated at desks and their head was down. Nobody looked after that. There was no word spoken. So there was a guy named Janusz Sielkowski, who about a year later became Secretary of State of Poland. I said, Janusz, what, what is going on? This is really eerie. What's happening? And he said, well, you don't understand. He said, in each of their countries, if they say the wrong thing to their brother, to their neighbor, to their bus driver, they disappear. They are afraid of what you said if they don't. So that night, we took them to Chopin's house in North in North Warsaw, a beautiful hall. And he had a, he had a music room with it, actually 150 seats, and all random seats, you know, as you see in the movies and the other days. We had three pianists who came to play his three pianos. They played three of his great, great pieces, including the Polonaise, which is one of my favorite piano pieces. After that, I took them to a Polish beer hall. This is now about 9 o'clock, and they go to the beer hall, and there's all this garish, wonderful, colorful dress, and band, boom, boom, boom. And we're drinking beer. About 11 o'clock, I got up and I said, look, I want someone from every country represented here to sing a song for country. And that way we will get to know each other better. So I'm going to sing from Porgy and Bess, and I describe what Porgy and Bess was, the song Summertime. And on the first time, so I sang, Summertime, who sang a song. The next song was a guy from Belarus who sang some dirge. This was Belarus, they would sing <laughs> And we went around the world, and everybody sang a song. Finally, at 2 o'clock in the morning, we're in a big circle, standing with our arms around each other. And the, the man from Belarus says, Peter, I would like to sing one more song of your country. And I said, what would you like to sing? He said, let us sing, we shall overcome. So arms and our 140 at this point sang, we shall overcome. I was crying, but I was not alone. Everybody had tears running down my face. There was emotion that came from this, the opening of the spirit. The next morning when we reconvened uh, at 8 o'clock, it was a very uh, the most animated, engaging thing going on with these people. The world had changed. They could communicate with each other. Music is very powerful. Now, humor is another one. The humor part of too. I know uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ryan, that you like humor. So I'll tell you this one. I was there hosting a dinner for the chairman of the election commission of Russia the night of the the night before the uh, the 2000 election where uh, Putin became president. And uh, I was sitting with him. He spoke fairly decently. 
And so I was telling him a series of Russian jokes. These are jokes from Russians about Russians. It's a great humor. I love Russians because they're really that way. And he says, I have a story, I have a story. I said, well, stand and tell the story. There are about 60 people in the room, half Russian, half American. So he got up and he said, uh, okay, uh, Peter asked me to tell the story. He is tomorrow night. Uh, my chief of staff come in, he said, I have good news and bad news. He said, oh, okay. Well, give me the bad news first. What is the bad news? He says, Zuganov, he was out of the comments probably. Zuganov got 62% of the vote. Oh, oh my God. Poland's going to kill me. I, I got to go hide. Oh, okay. Well, what's the good news? He says, Putin got 92% of the vote. <laughs> so, what do you want? It's a remarkable thing. It's the music and laughter. Uh, often when we face challenges, we say, man, that's really, that looks really good. Yeah, it's kind of complicated. So, uh, uh, I'll go back to my mind stuff. Thank you very much. I'm not going to do it. And you know, I, I see a lot of good people just kind of between them. Uh, the, the, literally, most of all, being killed in the last 25 years. And they come in and they always ask the same question, how do you do what you do? How do you do it? And I was going to get the back part of this too far over here. So I take a big piece of paper and I write a line on it and I cross it and I go, these are the people in your community, the community, whatever community you're in. I said, and I draw a line over here, it's about an inch away from the edge. I said, in there are the people who actually figured out what they want to do. And then I draw what it's about. This is far, maybe a millimeter part. He said, what's that? I said, well, that's the people who are willing to commit the energy, time, and resources to get it done. If you're in this little line, there are not many people there. You can do almost anything you want, provided it makes sense. So, I'm going to talk to you about one of those experiences. In the, in the 80s, Nicaragua was a, given a lot of attention. It was a nightmare, if you may remember. It was kind of confusing those countries. Some of these, those, who's, who, who's fighting, who, who are we with, are we with anybody? Um, the fact is that some of these just came in and removed a, a vicious dictator from office and then took over and became as vicious as the dictator they replaced. Uh, internally, a civil war started represented by uh, an art, art press and the Congress versus the Sandinistas. The Center for Democracy stepped up with, uh, and joined with others in a series of activities intended to uh, end that civil war and to seek peace through the fair elections. Uh, there were four organizations permitted and invited by all parties, the UN, the uh, OAS, the Carter Center, and the Center for Democracy. Those are the only ones permitted. In the course of that, uh, uh, one weekend, uh, I took 16 Americans down there, uh, left or right wing politically. Um, they included Mary Madeline, who was the chief of staff of the Republican National Chairman, Brent Bozell, the founder of the American Soviet Union, Bob Beckel, actually from Old Line, Connecticut, believe it or not, a very liberal consultant, sometime television host. On the Sunday of our weekend there, we were to go out to a city called, a town called Masatepe in southern Nicaragua, and then later in the afternoon we go to Sandina in Masatepe. We were going to watch a rally of the, uh, of the UNO, uh, this is a combination of 15 parties, communists and fascists all joined together in the Sandinista. And uh, in the afternoon we were going to go to the Sandinista rally. We arrived in, in Masatepe and we were proud of some. 14,000 people, people listening to a series of speeches by various candidates. Uh, as Milan Tichuara, the candidate for president uh, of Nicaragua, ended the rally singing the Nicaragua national anthem. A mob of young Sandinistas called the Tulas Dinas, the divine mob, uh, attacked the crowd with machetes and clubs. In the course of that, they killed one person and they injured many. I, by the way, was right in the line, and then coming in the attack, I was the only one between them and the crowd. I managed to jump a six foot high wall without <laughs> touching it. <laughs> I was a little bit competitive. So, 
moments later, as uh, I tried to get our group together, I heard gunfire. I came around the corner, and up this road, there was a car that turned over, and there was gasoline on the fire, one of the movies, right? Coming down the gutter. And there was gunfire coming out of this building. It was the South East Headquarters, automatic weapons. And I look ahead, and I see Mary Madeline frozen, 20 feet in front of this automatic weapon, frozen. Didn't know what to do. I ran, you know, you know that's pretty good. I ran, I picked her up, and I bought her behind a tree, and basically saved her from all of that. Well, the problem we had was that no one saw this happen. All of the press were in San Jose, Costa Rica. Imagine meeting with the presidential group that we'd started about four months earlier. And uh, so we had to uh, do something about that. We actually had a Fox camera with us that actually caught the killing and a lot of the mayhem. So we had to go to uh, San Jose the next day. I want you to picture this and all they, they went through full searches of everything they had. I had a VHF tape box taped to the inside of my thigh. It wasn't fun walking. <laughs> but nobody here to check. So, so we got this house and we went and tried to go inside the presidential meeting, but we were not allowed. So as James Bond would say, stirred but not shaken, we decided we were going to have a press conference outside. We actually got a, 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 a microphone, we got a, a television, we got electricity, I don't know how we did that, and we had some 25 old press and some 10 cameras outside, because this was action. And we reported what had taken place in Las Tepe the day before. Um, the American press was really skeptical. Bob Becker let him up, but he would know him. He was a very, very, very tough guy. And, and he, he, he hated those hunters. And he was pro Sandinista, but not after this. I think a New York Times guy said, Well, this is a fake. This is a bush. Becker said, Oh, I'm going to show you what it is. <laughs> well, as it turns out, this was told, this story was told all over the world that appeared on Channel 9 once the next night and never was seen ever by any American press at all, ever. But the net result was the world press was so severe on the Sandinistas that they instructed everyone to stop violence. Now our problem was it's a group called Contras. Uh, on, on, we came back from Washington to Washington about three days later and got in the car with Mary and she said, we're going to take a little trip and drove right into the White House. And Bob Beckel went out and I saw myself and Mary sat with President Bush and uh, Vice President Dan Quinn yeah, for 59 minutes. Now, for those of you who know White House, 59 minutes is like a week and a half. Anyway, at the end of that, President Bush said, Peter, is there anything that I can do to make things work for you? And I gave him three things, and I won't get into the three. But the third one, I said, we would like to meet with the Contra commanders. Not the fancy guys in Miami, not the guys in Washington. We want to meet with the Contra, the, the Asher guys in the NP. And we'll meet in the Nicaragua, we'll meet in the Nicaragua. Well, December 23, at 10 o'clock at night, uh, Alan and I went and met with uh, six of the commanders of the Contras in the Sheridan Hotel, about two blocks from the Miami airport. And we worked until 10 the next morning, all night, talking. And at 11 o'clock, we did a press conference where we announced a ceasefire on the part of the Congress until after the election. The net result was, with the exception of one minor event, there was no violence in Nicaragua, and the people could feel it. And they were not voted, and despite Sandinistas stealing probably a million votes, they still lost two to one. Um, in case you have thought about it, that's what we call getting the job done. That was standing inside that whole line and doing it. So in the world of democratization, the, the enemy is a mixture of impatience, uh, a lack of understanding of the meaning of winning and losing. Interesting point of view. And inevitably corruption. This is what happens in these societies. In most of the countries in which you work, people never vote. They never vote. They never have a chance to vote. So the reaction in most cultures was to just stand back and let somebody else lead it. And 
and then follow. Of course, these are the exact opposites of what we need uh, in order to get to the goal of democracy. So, I personally have spent a great deal of time in, in South Africa, going over a long, long period of time. Actually, when I was an editor of the Yale Law Journal, I edited a 400 page blog. We have a book with an article on part time. I was so mystified by this bizarre law that I became a student of the author Khan. So anyway, and, uh, as the elections of 1994 approached, uh, I allowed one team, we actually put together a group of D's and R's, Democrats and Republican leaders, to do things with the National Party and do things with the ANC. I took the Freedom Party, that's the Zulus. They were never going to win, they only had one small region of the country, but they were critical to play. They didn't play, it didn't work. A guy named Boo Lacey and Ant-Man, I don't remember. He had the play, and they didn't play. 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 Uh, what we had to do was uh, we had to do a little education because it was a good time. There was lots of violence. The so-called Reef Zools, those of those who left Zool land and went to Johannesburg and worked in the mines, they became anti-Zool. So it was kind of interesting again going inside of our culture. And so we had to do some things. So we arranged to have uh, 40, 38 actual um, African Americans to come to uh, a place up in the Dragonsburg Mountains, unknown to anybody, a place that nobody could know about because of all the hair violence. And we put them through a two-day process of what happens in the electoral process. Uh, there was a woman in the Republican National Committee, a very competent person, and me. It turned out there were 38 blacks, there were two whites, both of whom worked for the California Party. We broke the group up in, in half. It just happened that in the half, there was a white guy in each room. And so I took my group off, she took hers off. And what happened was precisely the same. <laughs> I said, first thing I'm going to do is we're going to elect a person who's going to be a political organizer, the chairman. Both groups elected the white. And I said, what are you? There are 19 blacks here and one white. Why don't you think about it? He'll know what to do. So no, we're not going to do that. So we worked and worked and worked, and we finally got uh, a, 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 a Zulu to take on that role. And then we tried to find somebody to stand up and serve as a candidate for the parliament, even though it's a, a mock election. Nobody wanted to stand up. It's almost like being in Japan, you know, nobody stands up. It's anything different. Well, we finally worked through that. And uh, I said, well, we want to do something different. When we go back, we worked on what we were before, what would be the issues, uh, but we want to walk in with something exciting. Now, you guys sing and dance. They don't, they don't want to sing and dance. So I had to start singing and dancing. I don't dance very well. Do it. No, okay. <laughs> uh, so we finally got it. So we got back to the main hall. And they came in, and, oh, we were singing and dancing. And then we went through the electoral process, and it was what was 2020. And the vote was 20 to 20, and the vote was 20 to 20. So I asked my white guy, you gotta vote for the other side. It's gotta be a working on the other side. So all of a sudden the vote's 21 to 19. So I said to our candidate, what are you gonna do now? He's going to kill you. Yeah. Well, we don't have a rule, rule for Luther. When you lose your So you have to play. They didn't understand that there's a role for the loser. And I said, well, no, no. no. Yeah, so you've won, your, your party's won, and he's going to be a minority of the problem, but he has a voice. You need to understand, even as a loser, you have a voice. It's part of the system. Winning is not at all, and losing is not nothing. It's actually somewhere in between. Anyway, bottom line, uh, we got through all of that. We finally got them to understand that there is a role for a loser that winning does not mean you win at all. I could go off and talk about what you do now and how to fill that. So I could walk there, but I've got 350 new silver stars. But let me, let me just give you a couple of thoughts. Uh, I want you to picture yourself walking in the streets of Kabul today. Women are members of the larger society. Women are allowed to be educated. Uh, women are allowed to work outside the home. 
women are contributing to their community. We call the picture in 2001. It wasn't that bad. Imagine trying to exercise your, exercise your faith in Samara, central Russia, just 20 years ago. You're not able to go to your house of faith. First of all, is a house of faith, which it wasn't before. You can worship, you can pray, you can teach others. Imagine a woman in Sudan through the miracle of the micro banking system. A person uh, can acquire modest equipment and able to weave a fabric, selling it on a very eager market at a very high price, and ultimately pay for the equipment that she's had financed and change the life of her whole village. Now these are the fruits of the ministry we call democracy. The status of a democracy may seem very fragile, and it certainly is in a lot of places, but the genie is out of the bottle. It may get put back for a week or two or a year or two, but the genie is out of the bottle. People simply seek a fuller and better life. They seem to have a chance to grow their families in good health and uh, in good spirit. Democracy is an essential tool in the process. Our local support of democracy is an expression of the values we learned from our parents and our faiths and our families. It's a form of ministry that changes the lives of people, enables them to live for family, community, country, and God. It's also an exterior, concrete expression of what Clark Seminary aims to do. Create a world in which differences are respected and where common good takes precedence. So I go back to the story I told regarding the school workers. It's all about people, ordinary people, people who need a hand, people who can enjoy freedom. Thank you. But I'm, you know, listening to you, 
In the next <laughs> video, we're going to really talk about substance for a good 50 years. If you look at the original conflicts, the original uh, fights, uh, it was over the process. It was over who we are and what we do and who plays and all that kind of stuff. And we still are living. We still are living. Uh, in, in a place like Africa, to take a specific, Africa, you know, a black man comes in and takes over, and guess what? I, mean, I, I work in, in Angola, and you know, there's four people who take, how about $40 billion a year, and they put it in their pocket, and they won't spend a penny on their people, not a penny. And this goes on year after year after year. So, the question is, how do you break that cycle? Well, the only way to break it, in my view, is if you start dealing with um, the uh, world of uh, the economic world of the country, and you take, for example, the Chile, uh, at the time of the Pinochet referendum in 1988, they would cut down uh, huge trees and they would mass them all uh, down in uh, the lake region. And they would put them on the boat with the bark still on and they would move into wherever they were going to use it. Uh, ten years later, they were actually going through three stages of development of the life. You go to Africa, it's the same thing. You take out raw stuff, you take everything raw, and the money's made not in the mining, the money's made in the sequential effects. So it's a long process for them to learn that. And there are people who are actually trying to work on that. But it's not going to happen. It's, you know, Africa, uh, it's, a, it's a scary place. Uh, it's got a lot of my life there. Um, it's a long way away. But they smell it, they feel it, it will happen. It's just going to take longer. Russia, different. That's a, that's a power game. I mean, again, it's been a lot of time in Russia, unfortunately. A lot of time, a lot of actually not much. But, um, in Russia, they, they, they literally, and I, I know this from the Russian friends, they will give up a lot of their rights so that they feel that they're part of a powerful country. It's a remarkable sort of thing. They know what's going on, they know they're losing rights, but they like to think of themselves as an equal in the United States and they're willing to pay the price. What, the, what Putin is doing now, I mean, you don't know this, but Putin is probably the wealthiest man in the world. It's pretty big. It takes about 50% of the world problems and puts them in a special place, not in Russia. So it's what's in Russia. And, you know, if somebody's going to, to appeal that to that them at some point, but that's the way it is. So Russia's a different game because it deals with nation power, feelings, and all that. But the rest of the world, I think, is very different. Um, we, uh, uh, we, today, we talked about the Holy Apostles College. It's not going to happen to be on the board you know, we have uh, over 50, well, 51 uh, Vietnamese uh, seminarians and nuns that are there to be educated in the country, but won't allow them to be educated. And, uh, you know, they're going back home and they're staying here. But how long does it take you to train, you know, the thousands that are needed? Well, it takes a long time, but that's the process. That's what we have to go through. So you have to be very patient. And I've been doing this for, you know, it's 1979. And it's remarkable to see the difference. I've seen progress because I've lived through a lot of it. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really that disappointed. I'm actually quite pleased. Right. Speak up, sir. This may be an odd question inside the seminary, but many of the places that you talked about, uh, your, your various democracy groups were able to have a very positive impact on the progress of democracy, but that came only after some type of violence where a bad guy was thrown out or a civil war was underway, one bad guy, another bad guy. Um, what about, what, what, frankly, what is the law? I mean, you talk about Iraq, you know, until Saddam Hussein was gone, from the work you were able to do with the medical gap, before the Taliban was gone, from the work you were able to do with the medical gap. How do you, what, uh, balance this, this notion that, that there's a lot of um, a lot of force and a lot of violence that's going on just to get you guys to the table at some point. Well, that is a, this is a statistic that blows my mind. Yeah, 
all countries in the world, only 11 claim to have never had a democratic election. Now we know that in maybe two thirds of the ones that claim to have had democratic elections, they haven't really had a democratic election. But they found a necessity to cover themselves. It's again time, time. But in a way, we are going to kick off this crack. So, for example, on Mount Russia, so um, there was a mayor of Moscow, his name was Boris Yeltsin. And if you were in Moscow, you would look at Boris and say, this guy's going to be something, he's going to go somewhere. So in 1989, long before the wall came down, long before the change, we would sit down with Boris and say, what can we do for your people that will make them happy? He said, bring them milk. Now that doesn't sound right, but if you're in Moscow, you can't buy milk unless it's in a, a special store. We bought it plain fills of milk in a Moscow, plain fills of milk. And people involved through those lines, 2,000 people, if you wrapped around a milk until you ran out of milk. And it was like people potatoes. Now, how can a vodka country not have bread? They don't know how to grow potatoes. McDonald's was called up two years before it opened until they were told to grow potatoes and become the fries. But, you know, so we bought in from Idaho, again, plain fools of tomatoes, but potatoes. The main result is, after about two years, and they started to move. We studied, I'm talking about some serious things. We did the same thing with Oscar RS. Uh, the the Oscar Wilson Peace Accords, we each got the Nobel Peace Prize. I wrote them a year before. We did it. Literally, and you know, that's such you know, it's, it's the intervening, it's doing changing direction of all that. But it's, you know, it's a huge task. But, so, yes, ma'am. And 
we started to think that, oh, I've heard about the Democratic Leadership Council. Well, I don't know what much Carl Lott people in it, but it actually created an ideology for the Senate. There was no ideology for the Senate. Republicans are now way off here in a wacky situation where they're fun killing each other, but they have this group of somewhere between 70 and 90, 50, whatever the day is, uh, who just don't want to do anything. We're going to go through that for a while. What's one of the things we're doing is uh, we've started a thing called No Labels. Heard about this? And no labels, the theory is we're not going to make a conservative into a moderate, we're not going to make a liberal into a moderate, but we're going to see if the conservative and the liberal can actually talk together, because they don't talk together anymore. The whole, the whole uh, field in Washington is different. They don't spend weekends there, they're all going back to the district. They're no one there. So we've actually started, actually got 96. House Democrats and Republicans that are working together on legislation. Not to cut a kind of education, but serious legislation. To say it, to show what they've done. Now, is that something I have to do? It's going to be two or three years later. But it's actually happening. And it's going to be great. Greg's a Republican, Republican leader. I, I, he and I can talk about anything. You don't have any limitations. So. Because I know what he is, I know what he knows what I know. We, we're all headed in the same direction. And that's what they have to learn about each other. So, hopefully that will work. Yes? I have a question in, in the trying to write in a sense of laughably way, but I identify the change that comes from the people, grassroots. And it sounds like what I'm hearing here is all leadership, you know, that, that in your view of democratization of the world or whatever, it, does it come from, do you think it has to start with the people who well, are? Well, you know, it, it starts from up here in the sense. And not, how do you scoop the people into yeah. What we do is we, we promote things happening. For example, in Kenya, which had a very poor experience with democracy, as you may recall, about five years ago, ended up in terrible violence, thousands killed. Um, we found and we helped develop a, a Muslim woman who actually put together a group of some 20,000 Muslim women as a political step. Now that's grassroots. That's the kind of thing you'd like to do. But at the outset, it's really hard to do that because they don't understand it. They don't know you know, so that's, a lot of that's got to come from top down until they have a sense that it's going to But if you've never driven a car and somebody says drive a car, what you do? So that's the process they have to learn. Uh, it, it's all grassroots. I mean, one of the, one of the great uh, challenges we have is most of us would like uh, for our government to be moderate. And what I mean by moderate is able to work. We would not want to go off that way or off that way. There's one thing wrong with moderates. They do everything Moderately. <laughs> now, that's not a joke, that's the truth. So, for example, in Ireland, a place of great, great conflict, it's 5% on the left, 5% on the right, and 90% in the middle of the victims. And finally, with the leadership of George Mitchell, who was wonderful, and so all the things, uh, and, and a great the Protestant, uh, 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 David Hume, who was a wonderful uh, parliamentarian from Northern Ireland. And things like that. They actually got the moderates of Northern Ireland to rise and speak. If you go to Israel, which is a nightmare political nightmare, the government is run by a third of the population that is religious, doesn't serve the army, doesn't work, etc., and about 10% of the rest. And that's the end of the government. They can't move over the right wing because they got it. But if you, could, if you could mobilize the Senate in this account, it would be a very different thing. We actually ran a series, we actually created a newspaper for Israel. It's actually run in, in, in Arabic, uh, Hebrew, and English. Uh, and it was a series of articles about what took place in Ireland and what took place in other places in the world when the Senate rises. Just didn't know. <laughs> so, but. I think of what the Heaven Project has done. Okay. The Heifer Project yeah. has 
done so much, and they start with the people who don't have a show by example. Granted, you need a political cohesiveness, and, but uh, I'll just. Well, that's where the issue is right. In places where there's no experience. I'm just picturing the scene I gave you of the Zulu tribe. But they have come to do it, they're not cool. And they're not going to know what to do until they have experience with it. So they've got experience with it. And they're right, they're right, actually, and the government actually works quite well. What's the impact of gender differences on the peace process? What's the impact of gender differences on the peace process or you know, talking or whatever you mentioned that I'll the system where I'll be able to I was I was giving a word to the lady from Kenya, a Muslim leader, and uh some Washington and I said that one of the things we work by the way, about forty percent of our funding is actually spent on women empowerment in places like India, which is one of the worst anti feminine places on earth. Which we don't see because we have a whole leader nonsense. It's a terrible place that way. But uh, in, when we were doing Iraq, we had as much money to do women in Parliament as we did to do the elections. Because that's the key. So uh, the way I phrase it is this I'm giving this word to this lady, wonderful lady, and I say, I gotta take this out, and I say, if a man does this, he goes, me! I won. It's mine. The women won. He says, "Let's meet together. We need to talk about the children." Now that's a very extreme example, but it's true. We think that women in government is a critical, critical step for any government as it comes forward, simply because they're done as true. It's not egocentric. It's what we do for our people. Thank you. Thank you.